Welcome to this session about uh, microservices. Not really a technical presentation, but hopefully 55 minutes that in the end will deliver some uh, new vision or some different perspective on a topic that is uh, all the rage these days, the microservices, and uh, uh, especially it's all the rage because of technologies like containers in particular that are you know, frequently commonly associated with uh, a concept, the microservice, uh, that is uh, frankly nothing really new in the history, recent history uh, of software. So the purpose of this presentation is primarily uh, giving you some sort of uh, uh, theoretical background for uh, the idea, the concept of microservice, which is a kind of universal. And essentially, I will try to, you know, to, 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 to glue together, to, to glue together uh, microservices with uh, some concepts, the foundation of domain-driven design. There is a funny part in this story, and the funny part is that uh, on my one of my everyday businesses, the one that revolves around uh, writing software, running a company, making the be IT background of this company grow, at some point we realized, oh my God, we have microservices and we didn't know. So we grew up, we cultivated in a way without even realizing an architecture that grew up over time, I'm, I'm talking here about uh, uh, a time frame of approximately six, seven years. So in six, seven years, uh, a company that basically didn't exist, just two people, three people, grew up to be not really a giant, of course, but it's a company of 30 people, 60 if we consider the entire range of people, employee, non-employee, just contractors and so forth. Uh, we do business in uh, professional sport. So if you, especially if you, if you like tennis, if you know about tennis and tennis tournaments, professional tennis tournaments, most of the uh, infrastructure for a variety of tournaments of any size from Master 1000 tournaments uh, nine of them in a year in, where top players participate to small tournaments, but still international uh, taking place under the umbrella of international federations, we provide IT services. And in the end, IT services is web services. It's uh, URLs that return a JSON or XML, that that's the core, which is consumed by Flash or HTML applications, pages, front ends. Uh, but this is just the, the most visible part of it. There is, in the back, a collection of small applications. Uh, to cut a long story short, we have uh, in the back just uh, five or six, six websites, web applications. And at the end of the day, each of these applications uh, can be mapped easily to a microservice. So we didn't sit down at some point and discuss the perfect architecture. There is never time in development to, you, you never have enough time to make the perfect design. It just happens sometimes. So essentially, we ever tried, ever failed, but no matter, we tried again, failed again, but at some point we realized that we just failed a little bit better than previous times. Now, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better is nice. As a sentence, oh, it's pretty nice, yeah, and I believe it's pretty nice because it's Samuel Beckett, 1893 Nobel Prize for Literature. But the interesting part of this is that the book, the work, where this specific quote comes from, is called Worst Word Ho, and uh, uh, the title evokes uh, the words, the yells that you know, both pilots on the River Thames crossing each other were saying to denote the direction they were taking. So, eastward ho, 
westward ho, and the paraphrases, worstward ho, so directed towards the worst. Microservices, what is this? Now, it's a common joke in many uh, freaky environment, there is a new project or a new guy joining the team, and the guy, you know, brings uh, his uh, past experience. Oh, the company where I was before, uh, we were so successful with technology X, technology Y, technology Z. We were so, we used microservices and we really should be considered using microservices. Stop being silly, please go to work. Okay, so the reaction, because many times things, uh, things look different from what they are. Not, not, again, this is not to say that microservices per se mean nothing or are useless or are just hype or a buzzword. There is a, a little bit of truth, a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of value, at least, in essentially nearly everything. Well, I still have to find the value in Angular, but that's a different story. I could even be biased, okay, <laughs> when I say that. So things uh, many times look different from what they are. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of being romantic. You look at the guy there with a the saxophone, but is it playing the saxophone or is dreaming of some beautiful woman love from the past? That's just romantic. But this is a picture that shows uh, a little bit, you know, it, it's kind of scary because uh, you see the facts and uh, in the red circle put on a uh, media, you see just a, a fragment of reality that could be interpreted in a completely different way. So again, many times things look not exactly for what they are. And microservices, that's my point, uh, that's my feeling, are not exactly what we often hear and read they are, and uh, the difference that I perceive is that, in general, around the term microservice, the architectural value is much bigger, much greater than the technology value yet. And most of the articles in the literature we face every day in the feeds, we process mentally every day, the technology value seems to be much bigger. And again, Microservices. What is this? Here we go. Let's try to formalize a definition uh, inspired by Martin Fowler. Definition of microservices that is uh, uh, easy to, to, to find, is a million times quoted, and it's, it's so quoted because it's probably so true. So inspired by the content of this particular page, I would say that a microservice is a particular way of designing a software application uh, has a collection of independently deployable pieces. Now, if instead of using pieces, you change the word pieces with a more technical term of services, you are adding some bias, because you are you know, in leading the understanding process of who receives this definition towards, oh, serve service. In the software, service can mean a variety of things, and uh, what you understand by the word service inevitably depends on, on, on your background. So just because of that, because the background is unique to every people, using services in a definition greater than peace or a more generic neutral term starts making a little bit of a difference. But beyond that, this uh, piece of independently deployable software that all together with others compose the final general application runs in a dedicated process. Or mostly runs in a dedicated process. This is arguable. It depends, again, on the abstraction level. So is it a microservice necessarily something that, because it's independently deployable, lives on its own hardware and software infrastructure? Or would you consider a piece of software that 
within the same shared hardware and software environment is still independently deployable. A classical example could be, for example, a class library, which lives in the process space, had the host application, but because it's a separate DLL, has its own process, uh, its own project, I'm sorry, um, and uh, is its own file, and I mean, you can easily swap, easily swap DLL files, uh, changing uh, at, at the, with the guarantee of the same programming interface, the behavior. Anyway, those uh, pieces of software are expected to communicate through <sighs> mechanisms, some common shared mechanisms, mechanisms Lightweight. And now the word lightweight is another adjective, another term that in some way is uh, uh, critical from the um, understanding perspective. So it's another one of those uh, words that whose meaning depends on your background or lend themselves to be interpreted in a different way. So what, why lightweight here is critical? Because microservices, Services, uh, it's inevitably you think of SOA, service-oriented architecture, which was all the rage not that really many years ago, three or five, five years ago. The, I have a Microsoft background, so WCF was all the rage 10 years ago. And uh, SOA was uh, the theory behind WCF, Windows Communication Foundation. But everybody complained, everybody using WCF complained about WCF, and because of that complained about SOA because of the extreme bureaucracy in the communication layer, in the mechanisms enabling functionality. So we all dreamed of more lightweight forms of communication between uh, uh, services. Simplified and automated deployment, just the next step towards the need of a more lightweight uh, form of implementation. So those uh, uh, pieces of software uh, should be okay, independently deployable, but the process of deploying them should be as fast, as quick, as seamless as possible without requiring uh, uh, tricky configuration files to be edited manually or through a dedicated software. Decentralized control of languages and data, this is to say that because those pieces of code, we want those pieces of code that all together form an application are independently deployed, they are also independently implemented. So they can use uh, any language uh, we like every platform and consume data in any format. In other words, microservices is SOA just made simpler and oh my god. But why? Why uh, SOA makes such a bad effect on the lion? What's scary in SOA also for the lion? is the fact that the vision behind the SOA is that of a sort of virtual highway, an application as an highway with gas stations, stops on the way, and uh, the highway was uh, uh, fundamentally you know, uh, represented by uh, WS protocols, uh, federation, security for various aspects of communication, and there's a lot of bureaucracy behind those uh, uh, protocols, uh, and also a lot of bureaucracy behind uh, the, the highway and the bureaucracy behind the overall thing uh, took the name of SOA Tenets. Well, let's go through these uh, four SOA Tenets. Uh, the number one is uh, boundaries are explicit. Okay. Uh, really, really, really nothing to, to object to this uh, point, to this requirement, to this stain it. If we are talking about an extremely modular uh, kind of architecture, the very, very minimum we expect from every participating component module is that the boundaries are explicit. So it's very clear where each module ends and where each module uh, finishes. 
those uh, modules, those services are autonomous. So they are independent, deployed, uh, implemented independently and deployed independently and uh, with uh, a well-defined uh, boundary around each of them, meaning that there is an explicit contract that allows, uh, that makes it clear how to get in touch with that. So tenet number one and tenet number two are essentially common sense. We definitely want that to be in, uh, in the definition of a microservice. So we have uh, two additional tenets in the SOA, and uh, I could even say that the microservice is a SOA stopped at the tenet number two. Only the first two tenets characterize microservices. The entire SOA thing also has two additional uh, tenets that in the real world are not necessarily so uh, required. Uh, number three is services share schema and contract, not class. Yes, but there is probably no strict need to enforce, again, bureaucracy in how schema and contract are defined. We can probably just take for granted that there is a common way, a agreed interface, an agreed contract for the services to communicate without enforcing uh, rules, enforcing data number four, compatibility and, uh, and policies. So essentially, microservices is so up probably just without uh, the excess of bureaucracy that was added for probably good reasons. The good reason of creating the perfect world in which every uh, infrastructure, every software infrastructure is uh, built from the ground up with design in mind. And again, this is another version of the highway uh, in which the gray uh, blocks uh, uh, represent uh, software parts, services, but each of those services uh, has uh, some characteristics, so the, the, this first one here has a, a connection to something we can identify as a, a dependency on uh, external uh, web services, uh, but it also has the first one, uh, some connection directly to this uh, uh, cylinder which represents data or database owned by this service, and the orange rows are uh, the contracts that tie together the various things. So, in particular, the block over there and this block uh, have or can have two different ways of sharing data. So the official orange contract, but also a shortcut that could connect some parts, some, sub some components of uh, the first block directly to the database. Uh, this is horrible design. I mean, this is just shortcut. This is, this is a real world. I know. I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, if we want the perfect uh, design, the, the, the perfect policy schema, we have SOA, period. We don't need microservices. So if we are looking for something simpler uh, that, you know, make us happier at the end of the day and uh, with some uh, work done, uh, we must be ready to take shortcuts. Reasonable, safe shortcuts, yes, shortcuts. But now, um, if we look at the various blocks independently, we know that, it, it, you can, the simplest is that you think of any of those gray blocks as uh, uh, standalone uh, web applications. So every of those applications has a, or may have a public API, and the, the blue the blue arrows. And at the point in which moment in which we close a virtual box around those things, we have a, an entire uh, environment, IT environment with some entry points. And now the gray area with uh, the red uh, dashed line can represent the background, the IT department, the IT background, the IT backend of a company, and the various blocks, boxes, gray boxes, with their interconnections are the details of the internal implementation of the company backend.
Again, microservices. Vertical stacks of logic and data. And uh, the data that each microservice contains can be replicated in the entire big picture. So it could be that this cylinder contains replicated some of the data that live there and vice versa. Because we, we are thinking and talking about blocks which are independently deployable. So they live on their own. So they need to have everything that makes them fully functional. We are not talking about islands, okay? Necessarily. So an island is a self, possibly self contained piece of land, but islands are connected to mainland or to other islands via bridges. So we, bridges are the, you know, the, the, the official contract. But the, uh, and we don't expect the island to be 100% autonomous. It could make sense in the real world with the approximation we know from the real world that some of those islands contain as much as possible within the land and then use bridges or use uh, other forms of connection to get what they lack, maybe periodically. So the content of a microservice can be accessed from the outside via that exposed data services, but can also be replicated internally. Easy to package, easy to deploy, easy to assign to development teams just because of this autonomy in terms of implementation and in terms of deployment. And then the next step is, okay, but once we have all of this, we have a, uh, started thinking of our application, or our overall uh, uh, system has a, a collection of interconnected pieces, and we expect those pieces to be easy to deploy at this point, why not containers? So the role of containers, Docker, for example, the role of container is, um, uh, is uh, easier to figure out and understand the more you are looking at this has not a single application, but the entire backend of a department. So where the gray blocks are real applications, and those applications internally could even be possibly made of microservices. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the, fir the first approximation of a microservice is not within a single application, but within a suite of applications that all together form a big software, large, significant software system. In this case, containers make more sense, because at some point you can have a server that is performing certain operations, and this server could be just placed, instead of an app service or a web role or virtual machine, on a container, which also makes it easier to, you know, to package and to move uh, as is without spending any extra time. As far as uh, developing applications uh, in the classic way of using an IDE, whether the IDE is Visual Studio or perhaps Rider, those IDEs, modern IDEs, are not really suited for uh, microservice uh, development because, uh, yeah, microservice is primarily architecture. And with Visual Studio and IDEs work primarily for single individual project made of multiple pieces. So don't expect that you can reuse uh, code Easily, uh, NuGet packages are, uh, especially NuGet packages on a company server, uh, are the easiest way to share uh, references across uh, projects uh, that altogether form a microservice architecture. So, in summary, <laughs> microservices exist. Or, and services because before microservices exist to fragment a monolithic application in smaller pieces, and the final result is that we have essentially, we move from a monolithic application to a collection of monolithic applications, just smaller.
and the way in which the new monolithic, smaller monolithic applications we have uh, uh, obtained, uh, the, the way in which those are connected together, depends on the needs we have. So we can have uh, one application having its own database and exposing an API towards uh, others. We, have, uh, we can have a few of them sharing the same database and a few others being connected using a bus. There are million different possible uh, variations on how we can have those uh, uh, microservices connect together and share uh, information. Okay, now, how do we get there? Uh, wisdom says that all roads take to Rome. I could even say that, you know, in Italy there are, it's not just Rome. Road signs sometimes are not exactly clear, so there is a place, a small city north of Rome called Viterbo, and when you drive out of Rome to Viterbo, at some point you have to, we have a big crossroads, and you can go straight, right, or left, and uh, road signs tell you you can go to Viterbo if you go straight, right, or left. So it, it's really up to you. Building-driven design is a methodology for planning software, for surviving complex, monumentally complex software applications that has been around now for, for well over a decade. And uh, we can recognize two parts in uh, domain-driven uh, uh, design. There is uh, the part called the strategic design, and there is the part that revolves around uh, implementation. Uh, the part that revolves around implementation has to do with the two main concepts, uh, the layered architecture, presentation, application, domain, infrastructure layer, and evolution of the classic three-tier presentation business data scheme and uh, domain model, which is all about building a software model that fully represents the business domain. And then within the definition of the domain model, the software model for the domain, we can use any programming paradigm we are used to, primarily object-oriented, but not necessarily object-oriented, also functional. The functional paradigm is uh, uh, suited, in some cases, to implement a, a domain model. So that, but that is implementation. I think that the real juice of domain-driven design lives in the strategic design area, where we find a few... I, I'm not sure that pattern is the right term, but I hardly find, can hardly find a better term. So let me call ubiquitous language, bounded context, and there are a few others, context map, shared kernel. Let me call those things patterns. So we have, we have in strategic design the ubiquitous language pattern and the bounded context pattern. I would forget about the implementation part as far as microservices are concerned, and I will focus on a strategic design. And of the two main patterns we have in a strategic design, I would even ignore for the purposes of microservices ubiquitous language, and I would focus on bounded context. Now, where is when, where, when is where uh, bounded context come into play? So when we approach the design of a software system, we, as architects, we see the list of requirements and uh, we try fundamentally to, find, to make sense of those requirements in the context of a single business domain. We have no reasons to split into areas, microservice, whatever. We, we have a one single business domain. We try to make sense of that through the list of requirements and whatever process, like you know, even storming, for example, we use uh, to analyze and make sense of requirements. But then it could be that at some point, through the rules of the ubiquitous language pattern, we have uh, reasons to split this into multiple bounded contexts. So one business domain split partitioned into multiple subdomains. 
Bounded context is just a technical name that in the domain-driven design jargon is used to identify a business subdomain. And uh, the boundary between each bounded context we identify out of our analysis uh, is uh, primarily determined by differences in the ubiquitous language. It's not the only rule, but it's the primary rule. It's the most common rule. Uh, concretely, when you make sense of, re when you process requirements, it happens that you run into words or actions of verbs that you know, mean apparently different things to different people. Or the same word used by different people with, not with the same meaning. So you find ambiguity, you find conflicts. That is uh, due to two possible reasons. Uh, uh, just use of bad synonyms in the conversation or in the copy, in the editing of the requirements uh, uh, that you have, or it could be a more serious, more structural thing, it's that there are different people in the company typically belonging to different departments or involved in different uh, forms of business that tend to use a word with a meaning or uh, tend to express uh, a concept uh, with uh, a number of attributes that is different from what other people can do in a different context. So this poses, uh, architecturally speaking, a significant issue. So we have something called, for example, the invoice, that to people, uh, group A has three properties and to and, and a certain behavior and has a different number of properties and a different set of behaviors to people from group B. And now the perfect ideal developer just to create an invoice-based class and then derive two invoices classes. And this is not probably going in the direction of microservices, of splitting responsibilities uh, and even at the cost of some duplication, but treating every area of functionality per se. So when we say easy to deploy, easy to implement, and this is a, an agreed point feature we want out of microservices, well, the perfect super class object-oriented inheritance style uh, design is the first thing we have to abandon, or we must be ready to abandon. Abandoned context is characterized by three things, three properties. It has its own ubiquitous language. It has uh, its own independent implementation, and it has, or should have, but that is the business that demands that, an external inter an interface to talk to external, uh, to additional uh, context. So the bounded context has its own language, and because of that is a uh, a piece of code we write independently from the others, where just the interface here, we define here in terms of an API, JSON API, that's just the simplest way, or perhaps a shared database, why not? Or a bus. So the way in which we make this uh, uh, bounded context to communicate with others is application specific or team specific. There are no forced enforced uh, rules. Independent implementation means that we can choose any language. We should, be, we should feel free to choose any language, any platform, any technology to implement that, whatever works. If the bounded context is assigned to a group of people, to a team that within the company has uh, some specific skills, don't blame me, web forms, and uh, the expected behavior, so what, what, what we expect out of that module is just stupid, you know, crude functionality. Why not? You know, using the technology, the platform that fits, that does the job and fits the skills of people. So independent implementation, and that doesn't break you cannot say, I'm not doing, oh my God, I'm not doing DDD, we're not doing DDD in this company because we use web forms. No, you're still doing DDD because you did an analysis 
that took you to identify bounded context, and then because of the DDD definition of a bounded context, you can now choose even web forms to implement the actual code. Why having bounded context? In summary, they, are, they identify a functional area of the application that, for a number of reasons, you prefer, you, the architect, prefer to treat, to better treat separately from the others in isolation. Uh, a reason to identify such a functional area is when the same term out of requirements means different things to different people, to different customers. Or when the same term is used to indicate different elements, or when the same term um, or when different terms use the same uh, behavior. So when you have an ambiguity and conflicts uh, that, oh my God, what is the right? So customer A tells me this, customer B is tell me, tells me this, but we're, they're using the same term. We, you, we usually laugh at customers. We make jokes out of that. But it's uh, tremendously serious, I think. Or another scenario is, when we have, need to have, because that's the business that demands that, a dependency on uh, some external subsystem that we don't own, that we don't control, or where we have a dependency on legacy code. So legacy code and the, ex the wrapper around the external subsystem are two perfect candidates to be bounded contexts, to be treated as distinct but connected pieces in our overall system. And this leads us to another pattern of DDD strategic design, context map, which is uh, where the architect defines relationships between bounded contexts. Now, in this graphics, uh, the blue blocks are, uh, represent uh, bounded contexts. And the arrows and their labels define relationships. DDD defines uh, three main types of relationships. There is uh, uh, the su customer supplier, the partner, and the conformist. Now, you, you see that there are some arrows with the D and the U near the, uh, the edges uh, uh, of the arrow. D is for downstream, U is for upstream. And essentially, this connection here indicates that this module is upstream, so is the master, compared to this model, which is downstream, so the slave. So it means that if something happens here that breaks the connection, this has to be adapted to the modify the broken interface. But I mean, it's the architect that sets those D and those U. And he does that, of course, given the scenario, given the, the teams, uh, given the actual features of the module itself. Now, in the category of UD, downstream, upstream, master-slave relationships, there are two variations. Uh, one is uh, the, the customer supplier. In the customer supplier scenario, the upstream module and the upstream team responsible for that has total freedom of introducing breaking changes. But if the relationship is said to be customer supplier, it means that in the vision of the lead architect, there has to be margin, some margin for negotiation between the involved parties. So if the breaking change is too much invasive, it is reasonable for the supplier, for, for the customer to complain with, uh, with, about that with the supplier. The supplier has the responsibility of listening to the concerns. They, they, they should try to find an agreement, but the final word is on the upstream. When it's a confirmist, there is no room for negotiation. If a breaking change is decided here, this, the dependent module, can only conform to that. And finally, the partner relationship is when it's 50-50. So when the two teams ship together. So they have to come to an agreement 
uh, if someone, some team has the needs of introducing changes, the other part has to conform to that. Uh, the confirmist uh, relationship is uh, particularly suited when you have a dependency on legacy code. And then another pattern in a DDD is anti-corruption layer that if implemented in the wrapper around, in this case, the payment gateway, essentially reduces to the smallest possible surface the segment of code that is impacted by breaking changes. So it's a sort of a facade in terms of classic design patterns. So in summary, the point of this presentation is uh, to essentially dem demonstrate through domain-driven design that one bounded context is, could be, one microservice. And now, this is the theory. In practice, say you are a startup, you are a small company. You hardly have the time to plan before you start your business. Oh, we need this. Overall, back end. So they say, oh yeah, we need to have a, yes, we are expected to provide a, um, a feed that displays through lead walls on the venue has with, with a live score of, of uh, ongoing uh, tennis matches. But we also need to have our own uh, CMS uh, where we store all the information about uh, the tournaments, about uh, the schedule, about the order of play, uh, about the, um, the, um, the draws. Uh, we need to have uh, some, uh, yes, some, some um, mobile, some device that captures uh, uh, from the umpires uh, uh, the, the current score, uh, we have to rearrange that through uh, our own live data server to sell that to licensed uh, customers. Uh, we also have uh, mm, a dedicated server because when we are on site, uh, we might be asked to provide additional service or we can find uh, the business uh, need to provide to offer additional services like uh, and we did it five years ago, the live feed of tweets, of tweets uh, and Instagram photos being posted with a given hashtag. So the thing that we, that we have here, okay, the, the tweets that go there, I mean, five years ago when we offered this service in tennis tournaments, wow, you're a genius, guys! But that was a service we didn't have. So when we started seven years ago, the company, we had to think, oh, one day we could go there. And, we, and to do this, we need to have a, a dedicated what is called the tournament server there, a dedicated server because, well, in this conference, we don't care. Or we, we, we expect that the audience that uh, tweets about this conference, the hashtags uh, monitored in the feed, uh, keep a code of conduct that is reasonable, honest, and, uh, and clean, and elegant, uh, educated, well-educated. But in... Uh, I mean, nobody will trust putting on the big screen with TV that could possibly take that and, and broadcast all over the world if there is offenses, images that are equivocal, uh, all those things. So they want to, to monitor, to, 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 to moderate the feed. So we have to provide a service that captures, caches the tweets, and then uh, when approved those tweets by a dedicated person, they will make it to the state that will uh, up, make them appear on the live feed. And that is another dedicated server. But then the player information that is being, is being used by a million different applications, because the, the player is characterized by an ID, and then this ID is used all over the place, but the name of the player is ranking all those things are story independent. So we have a player server there. So we, we never have the time of building this upfront. No chance, nothing. And in fact, when we were really a startup, we only had two pieces. We had a, a mobile IPAC, compact application there, and uh, the application was essentially uploading, calling, uh, 
uh, a URL passing the data, and this URL will, will have saved the data to a database and then re-exposed as uh, a JSON, uh, an ASMX web service uh, at the time. And this uh, grew up because, well, the moment in which we realized, but we can probably have a dedicated, separated piece of code to keep track of the players. Because we, in tennis, with players, the problem we had was, uh, what about the ranking? The ranking changes every, every week. Every Monday, there is a new ranking. So uh, we needed to have, uh, if every, this application and other applications maintain their own database table, we had to modify the ranking in a variety of different places. So let's centralize that. So we introduced the player server, and uh, we solved the two problems. We didn't have to enter player information in the configuration of the match over there, and uh, we didn't have to pass to retrieve, or in some other way, the info here. We have a, a centralized place which exposes a JSON API that works in both cases. And then next, why don't we create a CMS? So we expand this, not just to players, but to other uh, aspects, uh, draws, uh, schedules, uh, uh, tournaments. Uh, and then why don't we add a dedicated app for uh, uh, on-site uh, services? And then why don't we offer a full service that includes uh, hotel booking, uh, practice court booking, uh, badges, accreditation, accommodation, and transportation? and more and more and more and more. So we reached the graph of applications that sued together provide the back end of a company. But nothing of this was devised up front. It was an evolutionary kind of architecture in which every new pieces we added was added as a, a new mm, service, but small, a new microservice. So in the end, I ended up with a microservice architecture, and I didn't know. Sometimes I wonder if uh, ever have they been able, capable of preparing, designing upfront a microservice architecture if I had to do it upfront. But the, if I think it back, the piece of wisdom I, I see is the reason, the ultimate reason we ended up to this microservice kind of architecture had uh, to do, in the end, it had to do a lot more with productivity than uh, the will, the, the strong desire of using a cool technology or, well, I don't know what, or to say, how we do microservices, it's so cool. No, it was just, we have to solve the problem, period. We have to make the business grow. So productivity, more than pure technical issues or technologies. So the, the moment today, these days, uh, so we live in, in days, on, especially on the Microsoft stack, in which there is uh, the association between the concept of microservices, uh, ASP.NET Core, and Docker containers, or Windows containers. Uh, not that this connection is, is wrong or makes no sense. Quite the reverse. It makes full sense. But the point for architects, and also for, for lead developers, is not much in, oh, let's use Docker, let's use Windows containers, or let's use core because we can go on Docker. The point is, do we need microservices? Do we need bounded context if we move the analysis one layer, one level upper? Do we really need to break up the monolith into something that is made by different pieces connected together? I don't know if you need it or not. I don't know. It's a matter of costs. Because today, if you break up an SP.NET Core monolith in multiple pieces, well, you need to have enough service for each. It's a cost. You are multiplying costs. So this uh, multiplication of hosting, cloud hosting costs, has to be paid back by the business. So breaking things for the sake of breaking things it's not necessary. So using microservices because it's cool, and you can go on Docker, you can practice with Docker or Windows containers. I'm not sure. You need it. Not everybody here is Amazon, even though from uh, the names of the companies that I've seen here and there, you 
quite a few of you work for large companies, so probably you work really in an in, in, in everyday scenario that could justify uh, the, the, definitely the use of a service-oriented architecture. But this is not true for if you are writing a to-do application, to-do list application for your company or for your own internal purposes. Because in, in Azure, thanks to the cloud power, if you have a monolith, very compact and, and, and well done, you deploy that to an app service and then just configuring the app service, you can scale horizontally and still be able to serve more and more requests. And all you have to do to have this happen is essentially not using sessions and, and not using uh, uh, a cache or using the ca an internal cache with a, a grain of salt or just, you know, choose to use Redis, but you have to need it. Uh, the reason we ended up with microservices had a more, much more to do with the common sense in the end, an aptitude to solve the concrete problems than uh, religion, or we want to design this for big scale. Not everybody is, uh, is, um, is Amazon. So, when uh, WCF was all the rage, there was, um, well, I'm tempted to say a joke, but actually it was not a joke. It was a, a pretty popular conference talk called uh, Every Class Has a Service. Every method doesn't have to be a microservice, even though in this fake, you know, my friend Hadi, you know, simulated resharper offering <laughs> a new refactor uh, menu item extract to microservice. Okay, and uh, to essentially wrap up this uh, presentation, uh, I want to share and briefly comment a couple of related uh, pieces of uh, microservices of wisdom. One is uh, the the, the sentence known as the Humphreys Law. Now, George Humphreys uh, is not a fake name in first place. It is uh, uh, not even an architect or, or something. He has, uh, he's a scientist. I think he does uh, psychology. And uh, in his, uh, some, in his work can be summarized to a sentence that adapted to software sounds like this. The user of the software won't know what she wants until she sees the software. There's a sort of you know, quantum mechanics in it. So if you see, it's no longer what you have seen. If you're there and you see, oh, what you see is not what, is, what really is. So there is this sort of shift in between the user perception over time. So when the user describes what she wants, she says something, and uh, even the most expert analyst and domain expert uh, can capture something that once transformed into software, even literally, even verbatim, when shown back to users, uh, could uh, you know, in, in, trigger a, a quantum physics you know, me mechanisms so that, oh yes, but now that I see this, I think of. But this is normal, and, we, and it's an aspect of software development that, frankly, we should be able to handle. So if we print in our mind this, the user of the software won't know what she wants until she starts seeing the software. It has the, in, in it the implicit idea of iteration. Maybe not indefinite iterations, but a short number of uh, cycles to reach the final destination of what the user really wants. And uh, the a lemma to this, uh, to this uh, uh, law, an interactive system can never be fully specified, nor it can ever be fully tested. And if it can never be fully specified, an evolutionary architecture that adds microservices, one piece at a time, over time, with due refactoring, architectural, and at the implementation level, is the only savvy way to have and deliver software that works. Thank you for your time. <clears throat>